This is Ben May, and I want to thank you for being with us as we continue to seek the old past. Here we are in the book of Revelation, and I hope that you are following along with us. If you uh, don't have your study guide, I encourage you to, to, to get one. It's just such a great tool for you, I believe. It's, it's been a great help to me. Uh, the information will be on your screen. Another thing, I, um, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, send me an email anytime, benmay007 at gmail.com. I'd love to hear your feedback, your comments, uh, critiques, uh, whatever you might have to say in regard to our TV program, or if you have a Bible question. Be glad to, to try to get you a Bible answer. And so thank you for being with us. We're continuing on now. If, uh, if you have your study guide, we're, we are on page 134. This is Lesson 27, uh, and the way that we have divided uh, this book, uh, just for our convenience, because it's not that come that way. But uh, we're, we're in a fascinating book, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And we're going to be starting in chapter 8 here in just a minute. And so, as always, again, I encourage you to follow along with us. Uh, any questions you have, we welcome those. We just want to go back to the old past where the good way is and walk in it and there are fascinating things we need to see from this wonderful book the last book of our new testament god's people are being persecuted jesus himself has called john to see a glorious vision and the vision is of ultimate victory that God will achieve, no matter how bad the times will look, and, and they will look worse than in John's day. It'll get worse. But the Lord says it'll get better. And in fact, He will triumph, and if you're on His side, so will you. What a great uh, comfort that would be. There are a lot of fanciful interpretations of the book of Revelation. We are trying hard just to stay with what it says. There are some things we don't know exactly what some particular little symbol or thought or whatever it might mean. But I think we can get the big picture and we can get the message that God intends for us to have. You'll notice throughout the book that there are a lot of different numbers. The number seven is a very prominent number. It typically means complete or perfection. The Bible does that a lot using similar numbers over and over. And so we will see... Now we will continue to see this little book that has the seven seals. There's that number seven. There will be seven angels. There will be seven trumpets and, and so on through the book. And so we have already seen the opening of the first six seals. Now we'll come back and revisit those briefly. And also remember that in this part of our study, we've already gone all the way through the book of Revelation. And now we're looking at it in a little bit more detail, especially in some places. So again, the first six seals have been opened. Now we are at chapter 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. We mentioned this before going through. Can you imagine how silent that must have seen after all these glorious sounds and wonders and trumpets and blasts and thunders and, and now all of a sudden, nothing. It's quiet. And it goes on for 30 minutes. Now, many of these numbers are symbolic. They are not literal. But even if it's a literal 30 minutes, that probably seemed like a long time to John. And so we saw in these first seals, the first six seals, we saw this white horse. And on that uh, white horse, we believe was Jesus, the Christ, as the conqueror. He is going forth to conquer. You may be suffering persecution. Don't think that the Lord does not know what's happening. Then there was this red horse that takes peace from the earth, and then a black horse. And that black horse had a set of scales to weigh out necessities like wheat and barley. There was a lot of economic persecution brought against Christians. And then there was the pale horse. The pale horse with that sickly color, that, that death followed by Hades. And then the fifth seal, we see this picture of the souls under the altar crying out, How long, O Lord? How long until you avenge our deaths? And then there were earthquakes and the heavens were shaken, which was evidently 
the sixth seal. Then we come to chapter 8. And again, as we said, there was silence for one half an hour. Now we have seven angels. Those seven angels, there's that number seven again, are each given a trumpet. So we've got seven trumpets. If you think about trumpet, that's, that's, um, it's, it's the sounding of these trumpets. It's a part of the seventh seal. So the seventh seal would take a little bit more time to unfold, as we are told, the result of each of these trumpets being sounded. And then another angel comes, and this angel has a golden censer. He adds incense to the prayers of the saints upon the altar before God. Now, in the, in the uh, old tabernacle of the Old Testament, there was a golden censer that would be used to create smoke before the priest would go into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was and the mercy seat and the cherubim over the mercy seat. And that would be used to kind of cloud things up. But there was also the golden altar of incense where they would burn incense that would create smoke. And so he comes with the golden censer and he would be more like the one that was associated with the most holy place. Remember, the most holy place was a type of the throne room of God. So when you read in the Old Testament, the tabernacle had the most holy place. The temple that Solomon builds has the most holy place. And so in that would be these, these incense offered up. And so it's pictured as being added to the prayers of the saints upon the altar before God. And so the incense adds a sweet savor to the prayers as they rise before God. Again, a reminder, yes, you're going through a terrible time and you're praying to God. He hears. He's aware. And they're waiting for Him to respond. And He's about to. Now, when they say, how long, O Lord, He doesn't immediately say, okay, it's going to be this long. Well, what He does do is... Well, he starts from then, laying it out, item by item. Here's what's going to happen. And so God, as God's answers to the prayers of the saints, that same angel who added the incense, now he takes fire from the altar and throws it upon the earth. Now this is imagery that we see. In the Old Testament, as we'll notice others. And as a result of this being thrown down upon the earth, there's thunder, there's lightning, there's earthquakes. The seven angels who have been given the trumpets prepare to sound them now. So all this has happened. Now it's time to sound the trumpet. And the trumpets were used to warn. You know, we're used to, like the old, remember the old westerns? And the cavalry's coming. And, and they've got the bugle. And they're playing the, the you know, the, uh, the attack sound or sometimes they sound the retreat well there's no retreat with the Lord <laughs> the trumpets are going to sound and they are going to issue these warnings and these will be calamities upon those who die but warnings upon those who live to see what has happened and so again keep the big picture in mind God God is dealing with those who are persecuting his people and it happens over a period of time now, these trumpets are the beginning of God's judgment upon the persecuting forces that have oppressed His people. By the time of the, uh, but the time of the end of the society has not yet come. This is not the end of the world here. This is about God bringing His people through the oppression, and ultimately they'll win because God does. And these are warnings to that society. But it's not the end. And so we find these seven trumpets. And this is chapter 8. And starting at verse 7, the first angel sounded. So the angel is sounding by blowing this trumpet. And so what happens when he does? Now remember first, remember this was after the silence in heaven. And now the angels come with these trumpets. And so again, the first trumpet sounds. Now the pictures I'm showing you are just artists trying to kind of depict in their mind's eye what this might have looked like. 
as John is, is seeing this, these grand visions, these powerful images. And so here is this, this angel depicted here in the picture. And great calamities are coming upon the earth, and a third of the earth, the trees, the grass are burned up, and calamities are, are just part of God's judgment on that wicked society. These remind us that we do not live in paradise, and we must depend on God. And, and sometimes we don't know. Is a natural disaster part of God's judgment or just part of this broken world that we live in? My personal conviction about that is it could be some of both. Because God uses everything to accomplish His purpose. I think sometimes bad things happen that God doesn't want people to do bad things to other people. But when it does happen... He'll use it. He can use it to bring about some good. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Romans chapter 8, I think verse 28. And so you have how these trumpets. Now the second trumpet sounds. Oh, now, now there's another just grand explosion in, in John's eyes. He sees a great mountain that explodes and it really is reminiscent of a volcano. Don't think that this is new imagery to the people reading this. Because God has often used these type of, of uh, depictions of upheavals in nature to represent the upheavals that He's bringing among the nations. There's a similar expression in Jeremiah chapter 51, starting in verse 24, and we'll look at that. But what he's describing is not the end of the world. Neither is John describing the, the end of the world. But he is describing the, the, the destruction, the punishment God is bringing upon a people. In the case of Jeremiah, he was describing the fall of the empire of Babylon. It was the fall of a political state with great political turmoil. The, the uh, Persians, the Medes and Persian Empire is coming next, as Daniel also had prophesied. And so in Jeremiah chapter 51, he says, And I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for all the evil they have done in Zion in your sight, says the Lord. Now notice the language. Behold, I'm against you. O destroying mountain, who destroys all the earth, says the Lord. And I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you down from the rocks, and make you a burnt mountain. They shall not uh, take from you a stone for a corner, nor a stone for a foundation, but you shall be desolate forever, says the Lord. So he uses these depictions of upheavals in nature to, to, to uh, depict the upheaval of the political world that they were in. Now, this second trumpet. If Revelation were written somewhere around AD 96, and there's always discussion about the exact dating of a book, but if that's the case, it has only been 17 years since the vol volcano of Mount Vesuvius destroyed the city of Pompeii in AD 79. That, that was a massive volcano that buried a civilization. And so John's readers then would have this vivid image. They would know about that. It, it, it was a big happening. In fact, we have pictures, and I'll show you one, pictures of the excavation of those ruins some, many years later. Here is a picture. These are actual human bodies that have been just covered over in the molten ash, and lava, and all that. And they were able to, to um, find these. They're very haunting images, aren't they? And so this would have been fresh on the minds of those reading John's writing, this revelation that Jesus is giving to John. And so this great mountain explodes. Again, it sounds like a volcano. This is almost certainly describing the social anarchy that results from the fall of a major political state but not the fall of civilization. Now the third trumpet sounds. And in the third trumpet, again, imagine you're seeing this with John, and a great star falls to the ground, burning like a torch. 
name wormwood or bitterness, and, and many people are going to die. Again, going back to the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 14, and, and we'll look at this, uses a similar expression to describe the fall of the king of Babylon. Now, we just saw where Ezekiel had, um, had a prophecy about that. And, and so now we are seeing Isaiah. Or was that Jeremiah that had that? I might have misspoke just a minute ago. Well, therefore, the fall of a monarch or some great political event of an imp uh, uh, some great political ruler of an empire is being described. Let's go to Isaiah. In Isaiah 14 and verse 4, that you will take up this tone against the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased and how fury has ceased. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. So again, similar language. Well, let's go on to the fourth trumpet. The fourth trumpet sounds. And here it's depicted that a third of the sun, the moon, the stars are smitten. And these are times of great upheavals within society and where the wars, the death of rulers, the plague, great trouble, but not the end of the society. A third of it. So it's going to be quite a calamitous event. All of these things should make people wake up, turn to God. That's why God tells us things ahead of time often. So when it happens, oh, that came from God. There can be no doubt. Jesus often did that with his disciples. He said, I'm telling you this beforehand, so when it happens, it can increase their faith. And so it should with ours. Now we're looking in hindsight. But we can, we can see the value of John's readers who are going through the persecution wondering, how long, O oh Lord, how long? And he says, it's coming. God will bring you through this. Now, John's looking now, and, and now a great eagle, so an angel, goes flying by John there in chapter 8 and verse 13, and it's shouting, it says, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell upon the earth because of the blast of the three angels that have not yet sounded. So we had seven trumpets. Four of them have sounded. Five, six, and seven are coming. And so it says... Th these are so bad that we're going to just call them woes. In fact, it'll make the others look kind of tame. And so we'll see these in chapter 8, 9, and 11. Now we're going through, to chap through chapter 11 to see the things that are happening uh, on the earth. And then when we come to chapter 12, th toward the end of the book, then uh, from chapter 12 toward the end of the book, we'll see behind the scenes and what's going on in the heavenly places. And so these last three trumpets is, will take us through chapter 11. And so the fifth trumpet, that first woe, starts in chapter 9. Great wickedness is released upon the earth, portrayed as a terrible army of locusts led by the king of the abyss. Now the king of the abyss can't be anything good, can it? Perhaps that's Satan. Here's an artist trying to depict what these terrible locusts could, might look like. And, and they're taking the description of the, even that they have a face and a crown and all of that. And so he's trying to, to the artist is trying to depict that. It's an awful sight there. Great wickedness is released upon the earth. And, and, and it's like, and they would be familiar when a swarm of locusts comes through. It destroys everything in its path. A star falls from heaven. And he is given the key to the bottomless pit. So now he can open it. So he opens the pit. And great smoke boils out so much that it darkens the sun and the air. And out of the smoke come these horrible locusts with stings like scorpions. Oh, they, they, they were just fearful looking as John is seeing these images. The locusts were forbidden to harm any green thing. Now, regular locusts, they eat anything green. But these aren't that. In fact, these are symbolic of the persecuting forces against God's people. They're literally not going to be locusts that, that look like this. But they're depicted as, as, as that that can inflict great harm and punishment. 
they may harm all men who do not have the seal of God upon their foreheads. We talked about this earlier, that so much is made of the mark of the beast, and all, and which is a, would be a terrible thing. But little is said about God's mark, God's seal. And so the, the four angels were, uh, would, uh, the four great winds were being held back until, all, until God's people could be properly marked and sealed. And so they can, these locusts now can, are being released and they can harm anybody that does not have that seal. seal. So God is saying, I'm going to look after my people. Remember that the righteous are protected by that mark on their forehead. We saw that back in uh, chapter 7 and in verse 3, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So the locusts may torment but not kill. Men will seek death but not find it. It will be a terrible time. Even for those with the seal of God on their forehead, they still have to endure the suffering that is to come. The locusts go out like a mighty, horrible army, and their king is the angel of the abyss named Destruction and Destroyer. If it's not Satan, it's certainly controlled by Satan. Seemingly, this is the heartache, uh, the, the, the plague that wickedness brings. Sin is a reproach to any people, to any nation, the Bible tells us. The way of the transgressor is hard, God says. And so when, when, um, when all this suffering is depicted, it's a result of wickedness upon the land. But again, this is not the destruction of the entire society, but the grief that evil brings upon people. I worry about our own nation. I see the direction that it's going and, and getting further and further away from God. That's not a good thing. That, that is not uh, something that bodes well for the future of our society if things don't change. And so God lets men suffer the consequences of their wickedness undiminished. He said, yeah, it, it's, it's going to look bad there for a while. That's the first woe. Remember, there are three of those. That's the fifth trumpet. Now the sixth trumpet. So this, this is the second woe. This is in chapter 9, starting in verse 13. So God's army of destruction comes. The angels bringing their destruction are released. And we talked about this back in chapter 7. Remember the four angels holding back the winds of destruction? They have held it back till now. Now God's people have been sealed. They got kind of things have unfolded like God needs it uh, to happen. And so God's army of destruction comes. His, an, his enormous army goes forth, portrayed as horsemen on horses, breathing out fire, smoke, and brimstone. Just, just picture it in, in the most awful way their minds could imagine as they would think about war and destruction. A third of wicked mankind will die. But those who do not die, those who live to see the destruction, they still refuse to repent. So, what would you expect to happen next? Will it be good news for those remaining? Hey, this is the second woe. See, the warning of the trumpet has not been heeded. That's the picture that we're seeing. There's an interlude now as part of this second woe because God has some specific points to make. We're in chapter 10 now, Revelation chapter 10. And so th there's a strong angel that appears standing on the sea and the land. Must have been a huge image that John was seeing. And, and as you see this, and, and um, turning back to Revelation chapter 10 you see this and, and John is seeing this, this image and he's coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head his face was like the sun his feet like pillars of fire and he's got this little book in his hand well, now we've seen a little book before haven't we back in chapter 5 
he cries out and seven thunders sound. Again, imagine the sound of all this. You know, when, when it was silent for 30 minutes, that, that was unusual. It, it's just been full of these, these loud noises over and over. Now, John starts to write down the message of the thunder. So there's something, there's some message in there, but you know, we don't know what it is. Because he's told, seal it up, don't write it. It, it was too close, it's about to happen. Just, just don't write that, John. Now, we can just wonder about that all we want to. We don't know what that was. We're not told. The angel lifts his right hand and swears by God the Creator, the Eternal One, that there, should, there shall be delay no longer. So when we get to this point, God says, it's happening. I'm going to avenge my people. This, all this persecution will not stand. Now, this unfolds over a period of time, but when, it gets, when God gets ready to end it, He ends it. And that's what we'll see. It will come in the day when the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. So we've heard from six. Number five was a woe. Number six was a woe. Number seven, the seventh angel with the seventh trumpet is going to sound. And so watch for the seventh trumpet because this, that's when God will send His wrath upon the wicked and will vindicate the righteous. This is going to be the time of victory with this seventh trumpet. See, the mystery of God is complete. And I believe what we're going to see, and we'll talk about this later, we're going to see that, that uh, the kingdom is being established. Satan has tried to stop God's plan. He had Jesus crucified. That didn't work. <laughs> now he's gone after... His, God's people, Christians. That's not going to work either. And the kingdom will be established. God, the mystery of God will be complete. And so the, the angel tells John, he said, I want you to go take the little book. I want you to eat it. Now, <laughs> that sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? And said, and then prophesy against many people, nations, tongues, and kings. I want you to take the book. There's something important written. I want you to take it in. I want you to eat it. And so, that's what John does. It's very similar to what we have already seen in the Old Testament. If you go back to Ezekiel, Ezekiel was a prophet who um, prophesied during the time of the captivity when God's people had been conquered by the Babylonians, had been moved to Babylon, put in captivity. And as part of that, in Ezekiel, of his prophecy, back in Ezekiel chapter 2, he too is told something very similar to do. Ezekiel chapter 2, in verse 8, But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. And moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And it was, it was uh, he said, Son of man, feed your belly, fill your stomach with the scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. And then he said, uh, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. So he's taking these words in. It, it's a very symbolic way uh, of just uh, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, like the Lord said in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. And then he says in chapter 11, back in Revelation, he said, I want you to measure the temple of God, its altar and those who worship there. And so do they meet God's standards? Again, this is familiar language. They're used to that. Amos talked about measuring like that. Peter talked a little bit about that in 1 Peter 4. So leave the court of the temple for the nations to, tra to trample. God's very much in control, isn't He? Well, again, our time is, is, is coming and gone. We're going to stop here. And then, Lord willing, we're going to pick back up in our next lesson and continue on through this fascinating book. And I hope always, let's seek the old past.